I just spent a week driving the new Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross plug-in hybrid EV. What a mouthful. Quite an interesting vehicle and very different to the Toyota RAV4 hybrid, incidentally, we'll get to that. So if you're on the cusp of spending the big bucks here, and frankly, they are big bucks because this is a $15,000 step up over the combustion equivalent, here's exactly what you need to know. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously. Or you can click the card that exists in a state of quantum superposition, just like the infamous cat. Friggin' cats, dude. Always one foot in and one foot out of hell. <laughs> they get agree. Up there now, dude. The card, not the cat. And also not, occasionally. So, the obvious place to begin here when reviewing the Eclipse Cross, no longer an acronym named FEV, plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, is Toyota, clearly. The RAV4 hybrid, so popular here in Shitsville. The waiting list, incomprehensibly blown out to 12 months currently, so you can have one by Christmas. 2022, if you're lucky and nothing changes. The gullible still queuing up and gagging to inject Toyota's mediocrity into every available artery. And no, I don't know why. Toyota charges two and a half thousand bucks, okay, to go from filthy combustion RAV to clean green two-wheel drive hybrid RAV and a further $3,000 to go from two-wheel drive hybrid to all-wheel drive hybrid RAV. <laughs> so that's five and a half grand all up, which is what? Roughly, just spitballing it, you and three relatively high class uh, personal assistants in a spa suite at the Palazzo Versace for a three day bender. I mean, sales roundup and 2022 planning conference, clearly. And what you actually get with the RAV is a tiny 1.6 kilowatt hour battery and an equally anorexic approximately 30 kilowatts of electric motor um, performance, if that's the right word, plus 500 cc's of additional filthy combustion. So a RAV4 hybrid is mostly a filthy polluting internal combustion proposition with just the Goldilocks minimum of electric garnish on the side to harvest a small amount of kinetic energy in daily driving, vestigially sufficient for Toyota's out-of-control spin machine to greenwash the crap out of. Dude, what do I really think? <laughs> they do it quite successfully too, I might add. Like, Toyota's spin really is first rate. Hashtag respect. Ambient scientific literacy in Australia is quite poor, however, and Doubtless, this helps. Mitsubishi's Eclipse Cross plug-in hybrid EV is much more of a part-time EV than the RAV. It has a comparatively massive 13.8 kilowatt hours of battery storage on board, which is nearly nine times more battery than the RAV4. The Eclipse Cross plug-in has two electric motors. It's got 60 kilowatts at the front and 70 at the rear for a total of 130, which is more than four times the electric tractive effort potential of the RAV4. It's hardly cheap though. Like Mitsubishi charges about $15,000 extra for the plug-in. Batteries, of course, are not cheap and there are rather a lot of them in the plug-in. Now this here, okay, You've seen one of them. It's a five amp hour, 18 volt power tool battery. The brand is kind of irrelevant. Many batteries roll like this, okay? RAV4 Hybrid packs the equivalent of about, have a guess, how many of those? Have a guess, 18. Mitsubishi's plug-in hybrid EV, have a guess, 154. Now these things, right? They're about a hundred bucks each if you shop around, the Milwaukee ones anyway. So if that's some sort of battery value benchmark, then the Mitsubishi battery is kind of line ball and they're throwing in all of the other onboard electrical guff gratis. Toyota, 
not so much. The electric side of the Mitsubishi is roughly 25% of a full battery EV, in other words, kind of like the big battery versions of the Nissan Leaf or the Kona Electric. It's about a quarter of that in perspective. So the economics, for me at least, breaks down like this. You're going to pay 2.7 times more to go from combustion eclipse cross to plug-in compared with going from combustion RAV4 to hybrid RAV4. But what you're going to get, right, in return is you're going to get nearly nine times the battery and more than four times the electric power with the Mitsubishi. The reason Mitsubishi can offer such a big electric dimension to this car is quite simply that it can be plugged in, whereas the RAV4 cannot, in Australia at least. RAV4 is essentially the little engine that tries really hard, but its balls are yet to drop. It harvests as much kinetic energy as it can via the miracle of regenerative braking, but there are limits to how much energy can be recouped by regenerative braking alone. So the RAV is still playing with the little kids in the wading pool with the floaties on, while the Eclipse Cross is swimming proper laps unsupervised. With the RAV harvesting such a small amount of energy, only a tiny battery is required in the design, but obviously only a small amount of motive power can be repurposed electrically because of the way it rolls. Eclipse Cross plug-in can do and does do the regenerative braking thing also, just like the RAV4, but you can recharge the battery overnight by plugging into the grid. And that means it can carry much more energy at the start of every day. Toyota Australia wages this disgracefully disingenuous spin campaign against plugging in. They hate that. I don't know why. In my view, it really is reprehensible, like asshole grade reprehensible, especially as Toyota offers a plug-in hybrid RAV4 in other markets with an even bigger battery than the Mitsubishi. But they refuse to sell it here. They claim that we don't want that. Car and driver in the US describes the driving character of that vehicle as, quote, bland. Toyota is nothing if not consistent. If only mediocrity were an Olympic sport. Plugging in is such a burden. Toyota Schittsville implies. Our hybrids charge themselves, they claim. Which is technically true, but it sounds kind of like magic and is therefore just export-grade Toyota Australia bullshit. If you plug in your Eclipse Cross Hybrid on an empty battery, it's going to take about seven hours to recharge from a standard 240-volt wall outlet. This is probably going to cost you about three bucks. And you're probably going to get, I don't know, 30 or 40 k's of driving in pure EV mode before the battery runs dry. It's impossible for me to be specific on the cost or the range because the former depends upon the electricity plan that you're subscribed to, while the latter depends on the type of driving you do. EV range is going to be less on the open road and freeways and more in the city in stop-start traffic. An average car in Australia, of course, does about 40 k's a day on average. So many owners are going to be easily doing the majority of their driving in EV mode in this vehicle, especially if you can also plug in at work. In fact, the Eclipse Cross plug-in hybrid EV is much more of a part-time EV, which reverts seamlessly to combustion for longer drives. The RAV4 Hybrid is much more of a combustion vehicle all the time, with a small but significant amount of regenerative braking sort of on the side, and a great deal of overplayed hype, in my view. The caveat with the Eclipse Cross plug-in is that even if you have a full battery, if you drive like a lead foot, the combustion engine will activate to deliver additional performance. And you should probably stop patting yourself on the back for your incredible green virtue if you drive this way frequently. Below 65 k's an hour in this vehicle, if the combustion engine is running, it's either charging up the battery, which is approaching empty, or it's driving a generator to make electricity to give you additional performance. Under 65 k's an hour, there is no direct drive from the combustion engine to the wheels ever. 
It's just energising the electrical system only. Above 65 k's an hour, the combustion engine can actually engage and drive the wheels. But in practice, it doesn't actually do that all that often. When the battery is depleted, the combustion engine runs as a kind of incremental battery charger. It tips in about 5% of total possible charge, and then it shuts down, repeat, iteratively. That's its default setting. And you can, of course, manually force the system to do all kinds of wacky shit if you want, such as fully charge the battery using the combustion engine. But if you know anything about thermodynamics, you'll know why that's a fundamentally whacked process. Frankly, I found it better just to let the system do its own thing while I concentrated on driving from A to B. Charging the battery right up with the engine is ridiculous, okay, from an energy management point of view. It's quite an inefficient process. As for actually driving this car and what that's like, it's frankly unremarkable. And I know I say that like it's a bad thing, but really, it's not. I mean, it's generally better than it needs to be in the context of the needs and the wants of the kinds of people who are going to put this kind of conveyance on their ultimate new car shopping list. It goes okay. Actually, that's not really fair. It's better than okay. And it handles okay too, but just to be a hypercritical bastard, again still, whatever, playing to one's strengths. It's pretty stiff in roll and frankly not stiff enough over bumps and dips. And this is an intrinsic design defect that every electric type vehicle suffers when they spin it off a combustion platform. The Mercedes EQC is like that, so is the Kona Electric. They all behave in this way, and there's very little that can be done about it. See, essentially, if you add hundreds of kilos of additional battery, etc., to an existing platform, the additional mass is going to sit really low, because a really, really heavy battery goes down in the floor somewhere. Therefore, the total mass increases, but the mass centre gets lower relative to the roll centre of the vehicle, and you can't change the roll centre without a really, really expensive design revision to the platform, which the bean counters are generally unlikely to indulge, right? And the upshot of these two things is too stiff in roll, too floppy in vertical bump and droop every time. There's nothing they can do about it, and you have to say to yourself, dude, it is what it is. This phenomenon is called modal separation, okay? And it exists in all of these heavy eco cars that are spawned from combustion platforms because the two modes, like roll mode and vertical mode, they get fundamentally aligned for the mass distribution of a combustion vehicle. But now with all the extra hardware they add, these two modes are misaligned. Okay, and they're separate, and we've only got one set of control architecture to do both things, like springs and dampers, okay? They get good at one and bad at the other, or just mediocre at both. They're the options. It's not terrible. And in fact, you might have to have a degree in dynamics pervertery even to notice such a thing. I actually have a PhD in that, so it sticks out to me like the cojones on a big black canine. But if you just drive gently so as not to smear your lippy in traffic or something, you might never know this. It might never be apparent to you. So my strong advice is just test drive and see how it feels, dudette or dude. A couple of casual critical observations too that are not really the whole eco car thing, but they're still relevant. But the centre infotainment display, it's okay. Like It functions. But the graphics... They look like they were designed by a fairly talentless 12-year-old as a kind of school project. And car makers, I'd suggest, really do need to try a lot harder here, seeing that every customer these days is holding a hand-sized supercomputer with a really, really slick gooey. And yet, Pac-Man seems to be the aspirational benchmark for car infotainment screens and systems generally. Like, go figure. Also, the centre console area in this vehicle is yet another hideous concerto in piano black gloss. Okay, I hate that. The car I drove had only about 6,000 Ks on the clock and its centre console already looked like they'd been racing frigging bobcats on it. 
Given that it had been mainly driven by motoring journalists, perhaps they probably were doing exactly that. But irrespective, I'll be overjoyed when this obsession with Piano Black fades because it is one of the least aesthetically durable automotive surface treatments of all friggin' time. It looks great on the showroom floor, though, and I'm certain that's why they put it there. So, in conclusion, my take on this vehicle is... Don't spend 15,000 bucks extra just to start saving chump change on fuel. That is an absurdly indefensible position to take and in no way is it a valid justification to buy a car such as this. However, if you really like the thought of no tailpipe emissions during your daily commute, this car is a hell of a big tick for clean air in our densely populated cities. Like, it so is. And it seamlessly adapts to longer drives, like hundreds of kilometres this afternoon with no planning. No problem. It's a hell of a lot less convenient to run a full battery EV from the city to the regions. Like, actual logistic planning is required. Anxiety will be experienced. You'll get burned once or twice. Is that one critical recharger functional and or available in West bottom sex? What are you going to do if it's not? This is a thing. But this vehicle essentially, potentially, is a battery EV for most of your daily short trips. And it's also a relatively fuel-efficient long-distance combustion cruiser. And in that sense, it's a lot cheaper than buying and running an EV for commuting and also a combustion car for occasional longer hauls. At the risk of committing Toyota heresy again, plugging in is really no big deal if you have off-street parking. You're already plugging in three or four devices every day, most probably. I know I am. A phone, a laptop, three cameras, two mics, a couple of lights. It never freaking ends in my case. Plugging in the Mitsubishi is a reasonably idiot-proof process too, so that's nice. Like, you can't drive off while you're plugged in. You can't rip the cable out of the wall just because you're a goose. The transmission will not come out of park if you are plugged in, so that's pretty clever. However, I would make absolutely certain that the electrical outlet I was using was protected by a safety switch because I would not want to walk out on a damp morning half asleep with coffee in one hand and then grab a dodgy extension lead and wake up dead because I had unwittingly become an effective conduction path to earth. That's always bad. It always sucks. Okay. Safety switch, RCD, call balance relay, whatever they call that thing in your market, make absolutely certain that the circuit you are plugging into is protected by one of those. Double check, dude, because you only live once and that technology is absolutely miraculous. It senses an imbalance in the core and shuts down the power before the electricity can kill you. They're not even that expensive. You can fit a fast charger to the wall at home, of course, too, but if you do that, the vehicle itself will only charge at a maximum of 3.7 kilowatts, so that's going to take about four hours versus seven from a standard wall outlet. It, it hardly seems worth it. That's more of a pure battery EV thing. You can also recharge from empty to about 80% battery from a DC fast charger via one of those kind of wacky Chatamo plugs. That'll take about 25 minutes. But I struggle to see the point of this charging mode for this car or, frankly, that wacky socket itself, especially given the amount of real estate devoted to the Chatamo socket. Mitsubishi was one of the founding fathers of Chatham, so I guess they'd feel bad about throwing the baby under the bus by not including it. I suspect statistically that nobody is going to use the Chatham plug, at least not in Australia. Chatham might have some ongoing relevance in Japan, of course, where it was spawned. But even Nissan has recently divorced Chatham, and uh, it seems designed to go the way of Betamax, ultimately. Chatamo might remain relevant to so-called V2X applications where you use the battery in the vehicle to power your house. Interestingly, this car is absolutely supportive of that. It has that kind of technology and the battery is certainly big enough to be a useful accoutrement to your electrified home. But here in the technical turd mine of Schittsville, 
where everything from the fuel to the exhaust emissions is decades out of date. Australian homes are not yet compatible with this kind of vehicle to home application, V2X, go figure. However, if you're not prepared to plug in at all, like plug in your car to recharge, either because you've been sucking deep on Toyota Australia's bullshit Kool-Aid or because you don't have off-street parking and many citified people do not, you'll never really be able to exploit the full potential of this car. And if that's you, Eclipse Cross plug-in hybrid EV is probably not a good fit for you, dude. The battery is always going to be operating in this twilight zone mode of near depletion. And in that condition, it really is just excess baggage. And charging it up with the internal combustion engine, while this is possible, is essentially very inefficient and more or less an insult to the second law of thermodynamics. Also, you need to realise that hybrids, infantile ones like Toyotas and proper grown-up ones with adult-sized batteries like this baby, really only do their mad energy management voodoo in city-type traffic. Short trips and commutes to and from the burbs kind of thing. That operational condition is ideal for hybrids. It's what they were designed to do. They rock at that. On the open road, however, the electrical side of all hybrids is essentially just excess mass. Mass is the enemy of efficiency if it's not working for you, right? So if you live in the regions and you drive mainly long distances and you find yourself being drawn by the allure, the siren of the hybrid, right? The greenest option for you is not a hybrid, dude, not at all. It's probably a small, fuel-efficient diesel vehicle. And I know this last point is not going to sit well with the Green Virtue Brigade, not at all. Green automotive virtue is, of course, a new kind of religion, some sort of fanaticism. But I'd suggest this is the impossibly delightful thing about facts. You don't have to like them at all, and yet they're still facts. <laughs>